Okay. So welcome everyone to the uh, virtual uh, time series seminar. Um, we are very happy today to have uh, Tatevik uh, Sekposian from Texas A&M, who will be talking to us about uh, the networking, uh, sorry, the networking, or networking the yield curve surprises implications for monetary policy. Uh, we're also extremely happy to have uh, guest panelists, Julia Schomburg and Tatiana Dalhaus uh, with us. Um, um, uh, we will be having, we will be taking questions as we go. If you have any questions, please just unmute and ask directly. Um, uh, please note that the meeting is recorded, uh, although the, recorded, the recording is only going to cover the speaker and the uh, slides. Uh, so without further ado, uh, uh, Tatevik, it, it, it's all yours. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, Majid, for the intro introduction. Thank you to all of you for attending, organizing. I mean, this is actually a great uh, effort. Um, and thank you for having us uh, uh, present our work. Um, as Majid said, so this is joint work with Tatiana and Julia, and in some sense combines our, uh, you know, uh, joins our interests, you know, in a particular context. Um, so we're going to talk about yield curve surprises and monetary policy, but there is, uh, you know, econometrics coming in um, in the middle of it because we are going to use a particular kind of model to actually do this. And since the meeting is recorded, I mean, I actually forgot to mention that Tatiana is at the Bank of Canada and anything we say is not uh, the views of the Bank of Canada. Um, okay, so let me give you a little bit of a context of wh why do we care about the yield curve surprises and what is their, uh, you know, relationship to monetary policy per se. So there is this uh, long uh, and pretty intense literature uh, trying to study the sensitivity of long-term interest rates uh, to short-term interest rate movements. Um, you know, and this started with Kuttner. I mean, the more recent work of uh, Hansen, Luca, and Wright in QJE also talks about this in a way that, uh, you know, so I guess what they say is that um, the sensitivity of long term uh, uh, surprises have increased uh, to high frequency movements in the short term interest rates, but the opposite is true for the low frequency movements. Um, and why is this important? I mean, interest rate channel is the primary channel of monetary policy, at least that's how we teach uh, to our undergraduate students. So it's like the first stage of monetary policy transmission. So it's important to understand what exactly happens to the interest rates and to the whole spectrum of interest rates because, um, you know, uh, for different agents in the economy, different maturities are uh, more important. So this also came in, in the forefront of the discussions pretty much during the pandemic. Uh, in the context of yield curve control, okay, so even the Fed was debating whether they should target, you know, some other maturity than the short term, I mean, whether that's a feasible policy. Some other countries like Australia actually accepted this, uh, you know, and then subsequently actually they got rid of it. Um, so, you know, so, so it's kind of important to understand that in that context as well. Okay, so we link to this literature. But we also uh, know there is a, a highly contested and debated literature on the expectations and the um, and differentiation between market expectation and survey expectation. Okay, do they move together? Do they not? Um, and, uh, you know, I'm only citing Kobyan and Gorodnichenko here, although I could have cited a whole page of papers uh, uh, here as well, um, you know, documenting that there is somewhat of a divergence between survey expectations and market expectations, and presumably survey expectations is, um, you know, what uh, economic agents uh, are more likely to rely on. Um, so what are we going to do? So we're kind of in the middle of these two uh, um, branches of the literature, if you will. Um, and we're gonna look at the survey-based interest rate surprises across different maturities, okay? So subjective yield curve surprises. Uh, and then we're gonna try to link this to monetary policy. And uh, what kinds of monetary policy, so this also has been important in the last decade or uh, even more, um, is, you know, the multi-dimensions of the monetary policy, if you will. So what do we do in this paper? So if I go uh, according uh, if, uh, to the slides and not jump around. So we're gonna introduce a flexible time varying network model to trace propagation of interest rate surprises across these different maturities that we have. Okay, so we're gonna link this to monetary policy, as I was saying. And here, what we think is cool is that we have a framework where we can talk about conventional monetary policy. So essentially, if I have a short-term um, interest rate surprise, how does that propagate across uh, you know, uh, these different maturities? 
we can talk about unconventional monetary policy. So um, again, so I was alluding to yield curve targeting, although that's like a debated policy and not implemented, but QE has been uh, implemented in the last um, two decades or so. Um, although we're not going to deal with quantitative aspects of this, we're going to deal with um, interest rates only, or to the extent that uh, QE affected the interest rates, this would be uh, applicable in that context as well. And then we have a way to actually bring in this notion of forward guidance, that is the communication of the future path of the policy rate. So in this framework, we can actually talk about all these three dimensions of monetary policy. <laughs> So this forward guidance, as well as some other market conditions, could be allowed to affect the spillover intensity of this network. And the questions essentially that we can ask is, how do monetary policy surprises spill over across different maturities? And what is the role of the forward guidance essentially for these spillovers? So that's kind of where I'm going. Uh, contributions overall though, are a bit broader. Uh, so we have methodological contribution, okay? So we have this novel econometric framework that allows for endogenous and asymmetric contemporaneous spillovers, and contemporaneous is important here. Um, and then we are gonna show, you know, model properties and identification via simulation studies. So if you don't like our empirical application or, you know, the context where we're thinking about this, there's still the methodology that could be applied in different uh, contexts, okay? Uh, but from a macro point of view, essentially, uh, we have an innovative way to jointly model these interest rate surprises across different maturities. And we can talk to this sensitivity literature that I was talking about. And we can also talk about like the different dimensions of monetary policy. Okay, so related literature, I mean, um, I'm not gonna spend too much time here, but just to acknowledge uh, some contributions we relate to. So from the methodological point of view, we're gonna be related to this spatial literature, okay? And uh, in that sense, I mean, you know, I have two bullets here. So there are papers that look at the direct estimation of spatial weights as opposed to using some economic, you know, calibrating it to some economic variable. I will say more on this um, a bit later. Uh, and, you know, there's a literature that actually tries to model this spatial dependence, which generates essentially time variation in the network. Um, so, you know, this is the methodological literature that we are going to contribute to. And of course, from a monetary policy point of view, I've listed and talked about some of these papers. Uh, so we'll talk about monetary policy and interest rates. Um, and in fact, I actually forgot to say, Tatiana, Julia, feel free to jump in anytime you want to add something, okay? Okay, so that's kind of the introduction. So I'm going to walk you through the model. Um, and this walking through the model is more like my intellectual journey in this literature, which, which was new for me. So hopefully, you know, I can get you all on board of what we are thinking about. I will, I'll show you some simulations. I mean, we have more in the paper, so I'll show you some uh, in the context of the presentation. And then, you know, we'll talk about the empirical application. Okay, so uh, the starting point is this dynamic spatial lag model. Uh, so what is this? So typically people think about some variable y that is uh, pertaining to you know, unit i at time t. And then it's related to the same variable for unit j. So you can think about two states and then how they are related to each other. That's like the kind of the more conventional way to think about this. Um, so what is important is that you know, this contemporaneous relationship is actually guided by this, at least in this context, uh, with some weights, like how are these units related to each other? And rho t is going to be um, you know, spatial dependence parameter or a parameter that actually guides this network intensity in that it actually has a way uh, to make these units more related to each other or less related to each other, okay? So that's one. So this is a spatial lag. I mean, so essentially, you know, it's not a time series lag, it's a spatial lag. So how are, uh, you know, some units related to each other in space? Um, then we have some variables X, uh, which are individual specific regressors, okay? And here, I mean, you know, they can affect Y uh, with some coefficient beta K. And what I want to emphasize here is that this is not unit specific, okay? And this is a little bit like our innovation and I'll talk about relevance of this in a bit. Okay, so what happens typically is that, you know, these Ws are, you know, somehow linked to an observable, like a distance between the uh, states or their trade volumes and so on. So what we would like to do is we would like to estimate this. 
and other people have liked to estimate it too, and they did. Uh, so the differences that we're gonna try to think about asymmetry. So we would like to move to the world where unit I is not related to unit J the same way as unit J is related to I, or at least have a possibility for that to be true. You know, and if the data decides they, that's not supported, I mean, we'll get whatever we get at the end. Okay, so, you know, uh, I came to this literature very much from a time series perspective, I'm like, okay, but if I rewrite this equation, right? So if I rewrite this in a matrix notation, so this is my spatial leg, essentially. If I rewrite it in a matrix notation, I mean, this looks very much like the structural VARs that we work with, except with a twist that the ZT, you know, which is a matrix guiding these contemporaneous correlations, um, you know, is essentially an inverse, uh, which is a function of this row, the time varying intensity and the weights, okay? So does that matter? Um, so in a way, I mean, you can think about this is a different way of modeling this covariation, you know, that there's like a vast time series literature doing that. But I mean, it does in some sense because it has a particular structure, okay? So if you rewrite this in, inverse in terms of this infinite sum, I mean, what you would get is that, okay, Y is affected by axis, um, it's affected by the errors, by the disturbances, but what is also true that these effects are, you know, are very much uh, influenced by this time varying parameter rho t and the weight parameter, but it also has a polynomial, a higher order polynomial structure. So it, the model is highly nonlinear. And that actually is going to be obvious at the end when I show you some empirical results. Um, I mean, what is also common in this literature is that this roti is going to be, you know, in absolute value less than one, just to make sure this shocks die out over space. Okay, and then you know there are going to be some further restrictions because at the end, I mean, roti and wt enter together, so there are going to be some further restrictions to make sure that you know, uh, essentially, this shocks die out over space. Okay, so then what do we want to do uh, different? Okay, uh, so we would like to entertain the possibility that W is unknown, okay? So it's not linked to an observable, it's unknown. It's actually estimated and it's potentially asymmetric, okay? So this W, what we are gonna do is, you know, we're gonna impose zeros on the main diagonals and that's gonna help us identify the variance, covariance matrix, which is actually diagonal at the moment. Um, okay, so it's also gonna be normalized so that the maximum eigenvalue of W equals one. Uh, and again, so this is uh, to make sure that this shocks die out over space. Um, the way we will actually implement this though is based on this multinomial specification for the weights. So essentially at the end, we freely estimate this D, but that will generate a weight matrix, uh, you know, uh, that actually has a weight uh, interpretation um, of being between zero and one. So this is uh, on the weight part, okay? Uh, then you can say, okay, so how exactly are you going to do that? Uh, and this is where, you know, perhaps the analogy with the time series world actually helps. Because let's say if I rewrote this matrix notation that I had before for a particular case where rho is equal to one, so I don't have to worry about this, you know, and then a particular case where I, the number of x's that I control for is n. So this is essentially the format, okay? So this is what the ex expression will look like. And you know, now I'm saying I want to estimate W. And again, so the parallel with the time, structural time series literature would say, uh, you know, you are gonna get this essentially from the variance covariance matrix and the variance covariance matrix is symmetric. So how exactly are you gonna do this, okay? Um, and you know, people have used this intuition to estimate weights, but they can estimate symmetric weights, okay? Because the variance covariance matrix would be informative for that. Uh, now, you know, we would like to allow for a symmetry. Well, if we would like to allow for asymmetry, I need some more moment conditions, okay? And this is where this pooling comes into play. So essentially, you know, we're gonna pull through these variables, um, okay? Uh, and this is gonna generate more moment conditions, more orthogonality restrictions that we can actually use for identification. The way uh, we're implementing things in the current state, so, you know, uh, everything is just pooled, okay? So, uh, across the variables N. Um, but, you know, this uh, at the moment generates over identified systems. So in some sense, this can be relaxed and, you know, you could pull, you could pull for some subset um, of eyes, uh, not necessarily for all of them. But this is how we're going to get identification of the weights. Okay, so, um, 
Sorry, just a clarification on that because I guess yep. it's, it's important. I'm, I'm still a bit confused. Uh, so you say that for rho t equal to one, w is already identified because I thought identification was coming from the assumption that beta is constant and I this think. unknown w can only vary up to only w, essentially rho times w can vary over time and only up to a constant. And I guess I thought this was, this is what's going to give identification. Okay, so rho, I'll talk about rho. So here it's a little bit just I abstracted from it. So suppose rho is equal to one, right? So if W was um, um, not symmetric, you know, so the variance covariance matrix will let me identify n times n minus one divided by two elements, okay? Because the diagonal is normalized at zero. Um, okay, so this is what I would get from the variance covariance matrix of this reduced form. So that would allow me to only to identify a symmetric W matrix. Okay, so now I want to entertain a symmetry and that's where this pulling through beta, like pulling through X's is gonna come into play. So essentially, you know, XIT is gonna be in the equation for I, J, you know, but it's gonna enter with the same coefficient. So this is what okay. will generate okay, the extra conditions. Does it make sense? That is, was, it, was it clear? Yes, yes, yes. Because this is because this is important, so I, I appreciate the question. <laughs> yeah. So this is where we're coming. Uh, you know, we're going to get identification. Of course, then naturally, I mean, the question would be, what kind of axes are you going to put here so that it actually makes sense to pull, right? So this is important, and then you know, this is going to be empirical application specific. So I'll talk about that in the context of, you know, our application. Yeah. All right. So. Um, so that's the W. So that's like one part of the difference from the literature. Um, okay, so then I also had a roti, which is uh, generating time variation in this network dynamics. So here, you know, we're actually literally just borrowing from the literature. So it's not uh, uh, like we're doing something different, but what are we doing? So we follow, um, you know, some of these papers in the, that are cited on the, on the slides and Julio has worked on this extensively as well. Um, so essentially, I mean, rho t is gonna be parameterized to be a function of some unobserved factor. Um, you, know, um, you know, there are some restrictions here just to make sure that the rho doesn't get out of the um, minus one and one bounds. Um, but what is this factor? Uh, so the factor is gonna be determined by its past some observables and the score, okay? So this is essentially gonna be, uh, you know, the first derivative of the log likelihood with respect to FT. So this is a score-driven approach or generalized or regressive score models that people have used in the literature. And again, uh, just um, to say, why did we pick this route? <laughs> you know, first, Julia knows this very well, but second, you know, this actually results in an uh, exact likelihood um, that we could use to uh, for the maximum likelihood estimation. And you know, if you wanted to do Bayesian, this could have been helpful there too to have a closed form solution for the likelihood. Uh, but this is essentially a flexible way to bring in time variation that works reasonably well when you have departures from Gaussianity and nonlinearity. But uh, in that in this dimension, we are the same as uh, you know what people have done in the literature. So these are the ingredients, okay? Uh, and I think there's something in the chat. So I, I guess, uh, okay, so this is not for me. Um, okay, so that's the model. Uh, again, you know, you can take this model, apply it to other settings that presumably could be interesting, um, but I have to show you that it works, okay? So in the paper, uh, we have um, a lot more simulation studies. Uh, but I will just concentrate on two in the presentation. So I would like to showcase that we can consistently estimate the Ws. Um, I would like to showcase that, you know, we can somehow filter this network intensity with reasonable accuracy. So the data generating process that we use is essentially on the slides, okay? So uh, this part is the row, um, you know, and then uh, parameters are as they are indicated on the slides, X's are IAD draws, epsilons are IAD draws from a normal. Uh, so we do the simulation for, you know, some values of N's and some values of T, just to guide you, you like uh, towards the empirical application a bit. So seven and 600 would be the closest to what we have in the empirical application. So that's the result I will show you in the slide. Um, okay, so, you know, the weights are also going to be generated from a normal and then, you know, we apply the multinormal transformation to uh, get 
equations, essentially. So how do we do? Okay, so um, these are, let me see if I can make it a little bit bigger so you can see. Um, so these are various uh, values of W, so essentially this weight matrix. Um, and then, you know, as you change the colors from uh, green to red, essentially you have more observations. I'm showing you this result for n equal to seven Ks. Um, so what we would like to say is like, okay, the vertical uh, dark uh, black line is the truth. So the main message here is like, you know, as you have more observation for a given n, you actually, you know, get the more precisely centered around the truth. So, you know, um, we take this as evidence that this Ws or the elements of W can be consistently estimated. Um, the same goes for some of these parameters that guide uh, the uh, dynamics of the network intensity. So in the paper, I mean, we actually do a lot more, okay? So we have some mean squared error calculation, mean absolute error calculations for the different Ns and Ts, uh, but essentially the main result there is like as sample size become larger, both in the time series and cross-sectional dimension, I mean, you actually do better in terms of estimation accuracy. Okay, so what about the filtering of network intensity? I mean, how does that work? Uh, so here, again, I'm showing you only a few cases. Um, so we have a case where you have this uh, cosine pattern for the uh, network intensity. You have a discrete break, and then it's constant. Um, and then, you know, we report 95, 5 and 95% uh, empirical uh, quantiles for this case. Uh, the black line, again, is the truth. Um, you know, the green and the red uh, are uh, the estimated quantiles. Um, so again, so we take this as evidence that this can be reasonably well uh, filtered out. Uh, of course, I mean, in the case of the discrete break, there's a, you know, the uh, estimated parameter is a bit slower to adjust. You know, in the case of the cosine pattern, it seems like, you know, we can pick up the downward uh, uh, changes better than the upward changes. Um, so, this is uh, just to persuade you that, you know, we actually changed a little bit uh, relative to the literature, we think in an interesting dimension, uh, but that it works. Uh, of course, I mean, one can do a more thorough uh, um, anal theoretical analysis. So at the moment that, you know, um, we do not formally study the consistency or the asymptotic normality of the parameters, but we could, um, you know, given some of the work that Yuga has done before. But at the moment, we are just gonna, you know, we just show this uh, to you in the context of uh, finite sample performance. Okay, so that's that. So now I'm gonna move to, you know, okay, so we have this model that we think is interesting, and then we're gonna bring it to the context that I'm motivated with that I would like to talk about yield curve surprises and monetary policy. But perhaps before I do that, I stop for a second just to see if there are any questions on the model part, you know, uh, so that uh, everything is clear before we move on. Yeah. Okay. So I guess it, I just sorry. So yeah, uh, uh, rule here is uh, so it's it's a sort of like time time varying uh, uh, intensity of of network, right? That depends That's on. Right. That's right. Right, that depends on FT. So FT here, they are estimated using sort of uh, principal component analysis or? So everything is gonna be estimated, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, I mean, the parameters are gonna be estimated uh, with maximum likelihood and then you can- uh, All together. Out, like what the, exactly. Mm -hmm. But after, after estimating F in, uh, separately or I guess? No, no, everything is estimated jointly. And that's like one of the beauties of this. And Yulia, please uh -huh. jump in if you would like, uh, you know, in that because of the particular way how we model this dynamics, we actually can have a closed form solution for the likelihood. And then, you know, we can actually do this exercise. And that's kind of the choice uh, for why you pick this law of motion for a role. But, so, okay, so. Uh... So you can, you can think about it as a, um, in terms uh, maybe of a state space model, where um, yeah. in the Kalman filter you have the exact updating equations in closed form, um, but this is a nonlinear model, um, and and that's why it's not a state space model. Where in the states in a state space time varying parameter model you would have 
um, the for the parameter for the row or, or for the f. So so um, row is just a monotone transformation of the f to make sure it's stable. So that, that that's just um, just squeezes it between minus one and one. Um, <clears throat> and f um, is basically a, a time varying parameter that has an innovation. Mm -hmm. But not a, a, a yeah, just not a random innovation. But the innovation is defined to be the score of the predictive likelihood, the st there. Uh, and, so and, and this is, is 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 the so is the uh, so it's 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 playing the role of state here or so uh, s st plays the role of an innovation to the random parameter. So ft okay. ft plus one. So there is an autoregressive part. So, so FT is persistent, so it depends on its own pass, but there's also an innovation, the ST here, but the innovation has a certain, has a specific, um, has a specific um, form uh, and, and it's defined as a score of the likelihood. It's basically, basically you want to, you want to step with, with the parameter, you want to step in the direction of where the likelihood is the steepest. Uh -huh. Okay. And that's um, that's the driving force. The the, um, the the score of the likelihood is the driving force. Um, and and if if you if you use this um, principle, then everything is known. Um, so you can derive the um, the the um, the score of the likelihood. So the derivative of the likelihood. Um, plug it in and and get a that has the recursion for the for the time varying parameter, and then just um, numerically uh, optimized with respect to the static parameters and then everything is basically there in uh, in one go great interesting thanks thanks a lot uh, quick that uh, just to understand the implications on on impulse responses to understand correctly that impulse responses will not just differ over time up to a constant uh, because here I initially thought by notation by uh, by Helmut if you if you move from a, from if you take the whatever matrix capturing the impulse, impulse uh, the impact effect of impulse responses and you pre multiply by a constant that is time varying is wrong then impulse responses mm -hmm. on impact would only change up to a constant but within this framework they don't they change more than by up to a constant uh, okay, we so can let postpone me actually, discussion later uh, yeah but uh, let me actually say something that is like super important like leading to what we're gonna do next right so Again, from a time series point of view, I'm also very tempted to think about the impulse response, okay? But one thing that is true here is like, you know, so this is a spatial response. So in a way, I mean, you are gonna get just spillovers across the cross-sectional dimension. It doesn't really have a time dimension perhaps, you know? So this are like spillovers at time T. Yeah, so like this is the object that we are gonna get. So yes, it will be scaled up and down by rho t. And then, you know, maybe let me talk about, uh, you know, what we get to understand a little bit better about the scale. Yeah, let's talk about it. Don't worry. I thought it was uh, yes or no. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. But uh, okay, so Use. maybe if I understood correct, I mean, this is nonlinear, right? I mean, so the scaling is not just gonna, you know, if the change, size of the shock changes, it's not just like, you know, some scale up and down, but this is like highly nonlinear. And I'll show you some examples of like how this is super important. I don't know if this is where you were going with this, but yeah. There is a question from Xing. Uh, Xing, maybe you can unmute uh, yourself. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I just want to ask because in, in, in the SAR, uh, sometimes you can you can include a spatial structure in, 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 in the regressor X and even in, in error term as well. Is, is that possible? Or would that make a difference? Uh, in, so I think it's possible. I mean, I have to think a little bit more about like identification. I mean, like can you identify things in that context or not? Uh, but you know, I mean, a priori, I don't necessarily think. Um, I mean, we can solve the identification issue, sure, but you know that we have to think a little bit more about. Uh, to, I mean, I guess that would depend a little bit on the specifics you assume about the spatial structure on X and that's so one as well. Yeah, and if you if you think about the spatial structure in the um, conventional way, where you know the distances between units, the W that is actually observed, then definitely. Uh, but if you if you have to estimate the entire W, 
Yeah, you have to, as, as Tadevik said, um, the, yes. the, you have to think about identification. Yeah. I asked a question. You asked for questions, so we're all asking questions now. <laughs> I don't know. So, um, uh, my understanding uh, of the model is that you have this W matrix, that is the distance, and then somehow this row somehow intensifies or compresses mm -hmm. the effective distance. And uh, uh, if I have to rationalize with something that I work with, uh, it will be like having kind of a factor model where you have essentially one factor that is nonlinear. Mm -hmm. Now, in this application of yield curve, uh, usually for interest rates, I don't know if you know the Nelson and Siegel model, whatever, you have, especially that one that you fix the loadings, you have one factor that shifts all the interest rates, one that shifts some. So uh, how, have you thought about how this would reconcile with this literature? Yes. So let me actually, this is a great maybe, you know, transition point. So let me just start to talk about this empirical application. And then, you know, I have like one slide dedicated exactly to this. So let me talk okay, about this and then you, know, yeah. you you can you follow up if I don't answer because this is also a super important point yeah okay so now we're going to take that model again so that's the model if you have a favorite application please go ahead and use it and then email you and me and Tatiana if you have questions okay so in what we are going to think about is in the context of the sealed curve surprises okay so we're going to jointly model this thing so if you know if you've read some of these papers in um, this sensitivity literature of interest rates typically what happens is just like uh, you know it's a regression uh, line by line if you will you know a particular maturity on another maturity and then they you know the reported coefficients are there so we're going to model this jointly so that's like one of the you know, important things um so the dependent variable uh, is the survey implied surprise. So this is important, okay? So essentially we take the consensus uh, prediction from the blue chip financial forecasts, and then we have the realization. So, you know, uh, basically realization minus the six months ahead expectations, and this is the surprise measure. Okay, there's nothing magical about this six months. I mean, we actually have the other months too, we just didn't do this. I mean, just thought for monetary policy purposes, maybe like, you know, uh, uh, like that's a reasonable uh, target horizon to talk about, you know, but we can go back and do it for some other ones as well. Okay, so we have seven maturities, okay, in this survey. So it's the three months, six months, uh, one year, you know, up to 30 years, which is the long run. Okay, so that's the dependent variable. Okay, so this axis were super important for identification. Okay, so I have to figure out like some good axis to use. So the one, the one we're gonna use is actually lag the yield changes. Okay, so take it as given for a second and I'll come back to this. Fundamentals and forward guidance can affect the spillover intensity. So that's how we we'll model it. The sample we have is from 1988 till 2016, and 1988 is where we have the data available, and 2016 is when we were working with the data, so we, you know, we can potentially update this. We haven't done that. Okay, so this is what we have. So then, you know, Laura's questions come into play. Okay, so it's like, you know, the relevance of this model in the context of the yield curve surprises, like what, 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 what are we doing, right? So, in a way. If you think about the yield curve, and if you think about the Nelson Siegel model, and you say there is a level slope and curvature, and like you know, a lot of other finance papers say something very similar, right? Um, so if this is the model for the yield curve or yield curve expectations for that matter, from for the blue chip predictors, we essentially outsource this. So you know, if this is the model that we're using, you know, I just take it as given, okay? Because this is the you know, this is the leftover essentially, okay? If there was another model that we're using, I mean, that's fine too. I mean, just outsource, this prediction part is outsourced. Okay, so then I have the surprise. Well, a logical extension of exactly the same question would be, if I was using a th three factor model for yield curve prediction, what should the leftover structure be? You know, So like this error, uh, like does it have a particular structure or not? I mean, what exactly are we doing here? Why are we applying the spatial life model? So in fact, I mean, we were working on this and then of course, I mean, people who work in the uh, term structure literature always have uh, this like, you know, we already figured out how to do this. So why do you need this other model or you should compare this model to these other models? Uh, Laura, he was not, I mean, I, I met everybody else before, okay? So, 
Uh, but you know, you know, we came across this very uh, nice paper by Crump and uh, Gospodino, uh, which actually recently came out in Econometrica. Um, who actually argue that that's not entirely the case, okay? So they actually have some setups, like, you know, and then they uh, show that, uh, you know, the factor structure is not necessarily so obvious. So it's not obvious that the three factors are sufficient for dimension reduction. Uh, in fact, I mean, they actually argue for uh, strong decreasing local correlations in the spatial dimension, okay? So the argument basically, I mean, it's a more complicated paper, but I mean, if I have to give like a two-liner on this, uh, is that, you know, this, because there is a term structure, right? They're overlapping uh, yields that are summed up because, you know, I have the two-year and the three-year, right? So three-year is like everything up to two-year and a little bit more. So the more adjacent maturities, you know, they actually will have stronger correlation. And that's essentially the building uh, block of, uh, you know, their argument. So we were pretty happy about this. In fact, I mean, in their exercise, they modeled the error term as a spatial AR1, okay? And then when we saw this, I thought this is actually pretty cool because I mean, this is very much like the way we are thinking about this. So essentially the prediction part, whatever is the best model is outsourced. The leftover structure, at least there is some evidence to say that, you know, there is some spatial notion for this and one can actually take that into account. Again, like everything they're talking about is in the context of market interest rates and we're talking about survey interest rates. So that's gonna actually include one more dimension of complication into this. But at least that says, this is not a unreasonable way to think about modeling the surprises. So Laura, I don't know if this actually answers the question or not, but, uh, that's kind of how we are thinking about this at the moment. Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, okay, so that's, uh, you know, um, is this model applicable for um, this empirical application, if you will? Okay, so then the second part comes into play is like, okay, are these surprises predictable? <laughs> you know, because if they are not predictable, I mean, I'm not sure I can get some access to use it for to get identification for this potentially asymmetric weights, okay? And this is also, I mean, the last couple of years, I mean, there's like a paper after a paper talking about like, you know, predictability of the surprises, right? Um, in our earlier with work with Tatiana, we actually formally showed that FFR, like federal funds rate surprises are actually predictable with the past interest rates and the changes in these interest rates. I mean, in the context of this empirical application, so we actually also have done this exercise. I mean, is the past, uh, are the past changes in, in the past, past changes in the yields actually uh, predicting the surprises and they are. So I don't have this uh, coefficients here with me. I mean, one thing, if I if I did show you the coefficients though, you could per perhaps argue that I don't need to pull all of them together, but maybe it's some heterogeneity in this pooling might be appropriate. And that's something that we are uh, working on um, to extend, but we do have enough moment restrictions to actually do that. So this is kind of justifying like, okay, is this really a good application for this model that we're proposing? In fact, I mean, our logical process went the other way, right? So we thought this is a cool idea. And then like, how do we, you know, how do we model this? But then, um, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so how does this data look like? So these are the interest rate surprises at seven maturities, um, you know, you can clearly see this zero lower bound uh, effect here. Uh, this is what we are going to use, if you will, as instruments. You also can see clearly the zero lower bound uh, evidence here. So for, for what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk, essentially uses the whole sample. And, you know, at some point initially we had robustness for this um, yeah, to the zero lower bound episode, but we have not replicated after some updates. So, you know, this is something that I owe in the next version to all of you. Okay, so if I take this, I estimate our model, you know, um, and I show you a couple of things. Okay, so I need to show you the weights and I need to show you the uh, uh, time varying intensity. So this is the weights. So estimated weight matrix. So some people like to look at tables, some people like to look at the graphs. Okay, so it's a network paper. So we have to have a network figure there. So that's there. That's there. I like the tables. So I'm going to talk about the tables. Okay. So what do we have here? So these are essentially the surprises at different maturities. Um, okay, the zero is in the diagonal is imposed by construction because you know we have to identify the variances. So this is what it's used for. Everything else that is a zero, essentially, this is implied by the estimation methodology. Okay. 
So what we get out of this is that this weight matrix is indeed sparse and the relevant things are, you know, the first off diagonal. Um, so essentially the correlations of adjacent maturities or in Crump and Gospodinov language, I mean, this is the strong local correlations, I mean, are actually important for um, uh, this uh, dynamics or, uh, you know, the dynamics of the um, surprises. What is nice though, and this was our contribution and this was our interest is that if you actually look at this, so it's not obvious that the, you know, the upper of diagonal um, and the lower one are the same. So in some cases they are close, right? You know, if you look here, I mean, in the like two year and one year and one year and two year, I mean, yes, they are close, uh, but in some other cases, especially on the lower end and higher end of this um, uh, uh, term structure, of surprises, I mean, that's not necessarily case, the case, okay? So the six months to three months, I mean, you know, this is 0 0.2 or three months to six months is a lot, okay? So this is what we wanted to achieve. Yes. yes. Sorry, just a clarifying question. So you estimated by maximum likelihood and you got exactly zeros? Or no, no, it's approximated. So it's, it's actually, okay, but also because we have this multinomial thing, right? So that actually pushes it to the boundary. So it's like super close to zero, but you know, and what, so what was the rule if it wasn't significant or like what, what how did you decide to set things to zero no no it's just numerically it's either very close to zero or not so if you actually ah, round it up okay. around it. If, yeah. if you round it up i mean is this a zero or not okay yeah. so <laughs> i mean but this brings a good point so at the moment we don't Frederick, have to set up sorry may i ask you another question on the table did you try something sure. like this also on the spreads on the spreads, uh, spreads of uh, for the surprises. Stuff? Yeah, you can take oh, expectations oh, and actuals mm -hmm. and construct the. I mean, six uh -huh. months minus three months, you can yeah. construct the implied expectation yeah. and then that. Yeah. yeah, we have not done this, uh, but you think this would be useful? Uh, I, I just to see if uh, if you get something that basically has very mild correlations or no correlation at all across the spreads or or. Or uh -huh. if changing that would would give you something, uh -huh. and 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 you know I think spreads can be interesting also well, for a later project maybe on predicting activities and stuff like that. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. it'd be nice uh -huh. to see. Yeah, we have not done that. Yeah, so like this is just the surprises at this maturity, but we could construct the spreads indeed. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, but magic that kind of going back to what you are saying. So at the moment, we don't have an inferential framework. Okay. So we haven't proved normality or like, you know, we think we can. Okay. And again, like a lot of it relying on uh, you guys like previous work, but we haven't done it. So that's why, you know, I'm not going to do any inference here per se. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, okay. So that's that. Uh, uh, but again, so the, we kind of like this, but you know, in the beginning when we got this and they were like, oh, there is this old preferred habitat hypothesis, whatever, maybe this is what is at play. But, you know, in light of uh, Gospody, Nov and Kramp, you know, this is basically saying the adjacent maturity. So there's actually a spatial structure, uh, kind of very much like the AR1 spatial structure, except like, you know, it's not symmetric. So that's what we are getting from the surveys. Okay, so that's the way. Um, okay, so what about this network intensity? What do we get from here? Um, you know, so um, this is basically the path of row. Uh, this picture in itself essentially doesn't have any controls. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, just a time series specification capturing the time variation. Um, if you see, I mean, this, uh, um, you know, network intensity overall is high. I mean, in the zero lower bound period, if I had to average this and average the, uh, the rest, I mean, it's probably going to be slightly lower. Um, you know, then you look at this, of course, the first question is like, so what, how, what does this mimic? And we're not entirely sure yet, but, you know, we did plot the recession periods here. And it seems in recessions, I mean, the network intensity does go down, but it also goes down in other times. So this is not, uh, you know, conclusive. Uh, so what do we do uh, on top saying, okay, if I want to bring some economic interpretation, perhaps I can control for things that I think are important, okay? So we have three drivers, forward guidance being one, because again, you know, when the Fed communicates that presumably is with an intention to affect the whole yield curve. Um, okay, so this can affect the network intensity. We also control for business cycle in terms of IP growth and then just market uncertainty in terms of VIX. So forward guidance, 
so maybe I'll say a bit more on this because this becomes important. So this essentially is the path factor for monetary policy surprises obtained from the market response. Okay, so market-based monetary policy surprises as in Kirkinex, Second Swanson. So essentially it's a 30 minute window around FOMC announcement days and they have like two factors. Um, and then the first factor is orthogonalized such that it can be interpreted as a target factor, whatever affects the level of the interest rates, uh, federal funds rates. And then the path is the forward guidance. So we take this path factor. Uh, okay, so why am I emphasizing this? Because again, so these are surprises. So it's like super small, okay? And then this is what we are actually putting in the role. So, you know, what do we get? So, um, so this is the benchmark model, okay? So the, uh, the one that I showed you the, uh, the, uh, the dynamics of role for, and then I have model one, model three, sorry, model two, model three, model four, where you know you include the path, you include the path and VIX, and then you know path VIX and IP. Again, so um, the selection here is going to be based on AIC. So whatever model minimizes the AIC, and that actually happens to be the model two, where you actually control for the path factor in addition to the time series specification. Okay, so what does this mean? I mean, or this minus zero point five coefficient mean? So essentially it just says future higher interest rates are associated with lower uh, spillover intensity and then the other way around. So how does this change the path? Okay, so based on AIC, I like this better, but does this oh, actually, hold on, I guess I can't read of that. Uh, I mean, okay, so I think I don't have this here, but you know, in terms of like, if you look at the dynamics of the row over time, so this actually just shifts a little bit up and down the row. So it doesn't change the persistence, it changes the scale. And uh, you know, the reason is because this again is the kind of a surprise me measure and innovation measure. So it doesn't have much dynamics on its own to be able to do that, but it can like scale up or down the in intensity of the network. Okay. so. Now, armed with all these things, like, so what do I get, <laughs> okay? Um, so uh, to summarize this very complicated, or maybe not very complicated, but not highly nonlinear, at least, you know, model dynamics, uh, we look at, you know, what is known as spatial responses, or if you would like to think about it as uh, spillovers across um, these different maturity surprises. Um, Okay, so I could actually show you three-dimensional figures, which to me are always a bit hard to read. So we didn't do that. So I'm just gonna show you a bunch of two-dimensional figures, okay? Um, so I'm gonna fix rho to be at the average intensity. So I showed you the path, uh, you know, like if I had to take the average of those uh, rows, I mean, what it would be. So that's where rho is fixed. So in this picture, essentially, I would like to demonstrate the relevance of this weight matrix and the asymmetry of it. So what we have here is like 100 basis point interest rate surprise at different maturities, okay? So this is the three months origin, six months origin and so on till the long run, which is the 30 year. So I'm meaning that it's the, it's the maturity that you shock or the, or the variable- Maturity the that side. you shock. Uh, okay, sorry. and these are the different uh, yeah, values. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is the maturity that I shock. So I shock the three months maturity. And then, you know, again, so if I may- uh, Within it that, okay, bigger. got it. Okay, within that, I mean, the uh, green color is essentially the short term, the blue color is medium term, and the red color is essentially the long term, okay? Uh, so what do I want to say here is that, you know, given this model, now it's super important which maturity you are shocking, okay? So it's exactly the same size surprise. I mean, somehow the central bank manages to generate that size surprise. I mean, if this is done at the shorter end of the yield curve, um, essentially, uh, you know, it sort of stays localized, you know, so it affects the short end on its own, does not spill over much. Okay. If it's the medium term, you know, this seems to have a more chance uh, to spill over, um, you know, and if it's, oops, I went too fast. And if it's the uh, long term, that also somewhat stays localized. Okay. And this is very much driven by the actual parameters that we get on this weight matrix. Okay. So, then, uh, you know, again, this model is highly nonlinear. Uh, so rho makes a big difference. So, you know, rho on average, you know, if you looked at the path, I mean, it was pretty high and then, you know, kind of uh, 
precise around this average, right? So it's not like it was fluctuating like crazy. But if I take the minimum intensity, which in numeric values is not super different, right? And I get a very different uh, picture for the spillovers because now like really, you know, every shock at every maturity is, uh, you know, um, kind of stays wherever they are because the network intensity is smaller, okay? So, uh, you know, okay, so let me actually go back to this again because now I'm, okay. On the other hand, I mean, if I take the maximum intensity, you know, so all of these things kind of move together. And in fact, I mean, I'm showing you like 40 some, I think it's 40 spillover rounds. I mean, this hasn't even converged, yeah. Uh, so hopefully, I mean, this highlights a bit like, you know, this multiple dimensions that come into play and how, you know, this network intensity parameter, which can be affected, at least in our specification seems to be pre preferred to have this path factor in there, um, can really make a big difference in terms of like how do the shocks spill over across these uh, different maturities um, for the survey, uh, at least based on the survey expectations. Okay, so um, that's that. Now, I mean, another dimension of nonlinearity is that the size of the shock matters too, okay? So this figure is very, much comparable to the original figure. So here it's average intensity, it just is like a hundred basis point increase at different maturities. And here it's a 25 basis point increase. And then you see like the smaller shock somehow given the average intensity actually has a, uh, a better chance of going through the rest of the maturities than the larger shock was. Um, okay, and then perhaps like one exercise that is uh, interesting from policy point of view. And we can do these exercises like, you know, as long as we want. I mean, uh, there are many episodes that are potentially interesting from macro perspective, but this operation twist, I mean, this has been talked about quite a bit. Um, so this is essentially the Fed was trying to move the short end up and the long end down. And we like our framework because I can, we can do this type of exercises here. Um, so let me actually walk through these five figures just uh, to make you appreciate the dynamics a bit better. So the average intensity, uh, not average, the intensity is fixed at 0 0.95, which happens to be the value on the first operation twist, uh, you know, which was September 2011, I think. Um, okay, and then we construct a few scenarios here. Okay, so basically the first uh, figure here. Uh, so the three months is going up by one basis point, and then the 10 year is going down by uh, five basis points. Okay, so where do we get these numbers? This is essentially the market's reaction, okay? So if we actually calibrate uh, the innovations uh, to, 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 um, uh, to these numbers, I mean, at the end, what we get, I mean, so that even though the intention was to push up the, you know, the, uh, short end and push down the long end, given the network intensity and the weight structure, essentially all the interest rates go down. Okay. If the network intensity instead was 0 0.87, okay, so um, I mean, that wouldn't be the case, okay? So that would achieve what, let's say, if the uh, central bank might have wanted in that the short one is up and the long one is down, okay? Um, on the other hand, I mean, you could say, could I have achieved this in a different way? I mean, sh sure, I mean, you could have had exactly the same intensity as you had before, but you know, now shock it with 125 basis points. And, you know, in that case, I mean, you will see like this uh, um, dashed uh, green line is up, uh, you know, uh, while everything else is down. So there are multiple ways how you could get to the subjective that you have beforehand. Um, and you know all these dimensions um, and network intensity are actually very important in, uh, um, if you will, like guiding the final uh, uh, effect. Uh, I mean, okay, so the picture here says, okay, so I could also construct a similar exercise to this, but now I'm shocking not the three months interest rate, but the six months. I mean, so this seems to be more consistent with the goals of the operation twist. Um, on the other hand, I mean, you know, this is actually kind of replicating a similar thing, but uh, now we're targeting the two year ahead um, um, interest rates, uh, the maturity of two years. And there you see like the medium term interest rates also go up. Uh, so, uh, you know, 
we really like this exercise because you know at least like we're doing this exercise jointly the interest rate surprises um are modeled jointly so you really have a way to kind of understand the whole dynamics of the system as opposed to you know doing this equation by equation if you will uh, um, think, uh, sorry just uh you have five mm -hmm. minutes left just so you know it's okay. five minutes left yeah, yeah i'm yeah, yeah I'm, I'm almost done so <laughs> yeah. okay so uh, the conclusion, at least uh, uh, for what I have uh, for today. So we have this asymmetric and endogenous weights, and we introduce this into a spatial lag model, the dynamic spatial lag model that has been considered in the uh, literature. Uh, we think the model is interesting on its own, and then you know we show in simulations at least that it works. Um, we are very keen on our empirical application, okay, because it actually says uh, that this forecast errors or the surprises uh, as perceived by the survey forecasters, uh, you know, are connected via an asymmetric time varying network structure. Uh, but, you know, this network structure seems to be sparse. So what matters is the spillovers or this uh, local correlations with the adjacent neighbors. Um, and this network is like highly nonlinear, um, so uh, you know, very uh, like small changes in like some of these parameters. I mean, they actually can make a big difference in terms of uh, how the surprises propagate across the yield curve. Um, and we think that's helpful to understand um, the various dimensions of monetary policy. Uh, I mean, overall, I mean, we also are thinking of some other things we can do. So you know, wider applicability. So. Potentially, there are some other applications that could be interesting. Um, you know, the key is like we have this contemporaneous asymmetric correlations. Okay, so like uh, you know, there's a literature on network literature, right? Why the able dealers in multi and other authors in multiplicity of uh, papers where they could get asymmetric networks, but that's not a contemporaneous asymmetry. Okay, so it's like uh, propagated like a couple of periods ahead asymmetry, and this is a little bit different. Um, again, so this potentially could apply nice in a more larger macro context. Uh, and what I mean by this is, again, if you go back to my motivation or like my view into this literature from more time series perspective, I mean, this is essentially another way to model the covariance matrix. And if you could somehow get identification from external sources or instruments, presumably this could also speak to the structural of the AR literature. Um, and again, so, you know, at the moment we do maximum likelihood, but nothing prevents. In fact, I mean, it's pretty cool that we have the likelihood in the closed form because, you know, that could be easily adapted to the Bayesian framework as well. And um, that's what I have. So we'll be happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tativek. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the wonderful presentation. And thanks to our panelists as well, uh, Tatiana and Julia. Uh, so I will stop the recording now.